Oh, low on the ground for children today. One Sunday, there's heaps of you. The next Sunday, there's hardly any. Oh, that's right. At least you guys are still here. Well, when I was a kid, you may, you may disagree, but when I was a kid, and it's probably still true, I had the biggest and the strongest dad in the whole world. Is that true for you? Yeah? We can't all have the biggest and strongest dad, though. But it feels that way, doesn't it? It feels like your dad can do anything, can't he? So you look at some huge weight and you think, oh, there's just no way anyone could lift that. He comes along and lifts it up. Or you see something really high and you go, just no one could ever reach that. And he's always just tall enough. It was a little bit like we had Mark and Joe and Kara and Micah at our place. And Kara walked into our garage and she saw some weights there, a weight bench with some weights on it. She looked at these things that to her looked huge, which weren't very heavy. And she thought, wow, Logan must be hugely strong if he can lift those things. Because it's all how we see people, isn't it? How we see them makes us think certain things. Well, today in our passage, we're going to see that, that we have a Father in heaven who is greater and bigger and stronger and mightier than everything else there is. And that because of that, we are safe. We are secure and no one can take us away from him. No one can come along and say, ha, I've got you. You're never going to be one of God's children again. Once we're one of God's children, no one can ever take us away. Because the Father and the Son put us in their hands and they hold on to us. And no one's big enough, strong enough, or mighty enough to pull their hands apart. And you get nestled down in that wonderful little hand. Or you're little. His hand's big. He nestles you down in there and he, and he clamps his hands over you. And you're forever safe. Isn't that a wonderful thought? Because we have a very good God who loves us very much. Let's pray and say thank you to God. God, we thank you that you are a good God who holds on to us. Lord, we just all know in our hearts as we grow, we quickly come to know that if you didn't hold on to us, we would be lost in a second. And so I pray for these children, Lord, would you help them to see just how big and magnificent and wonderful you are. That in, in a similar to way to how they look to their, heaven, their earthly fathers, they would look to you as far bigger, far greater, and far more wonderful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, if you want to open up your Bibles this morning, we're going to be turning to the book of John. Gospel according to John. We're turning to John chapter 10. The last Sunday night, we looked at the Good Shepherd, and this morning, we're going to be looking at the second half of chapter 10, starting at verse 22, and we'll read through to the end of the chapter. So we'll be starting at John chapter 10, verse 22. This is God's word for you today. At that time, the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus believed them, sorry, Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. But you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will ever snatch them out of my hand. 
my Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. Which of them are you going to stone me for? The Jews answered him, It is not for a good work that we're going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I said you are gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming? Because I said, I am the Son of God. If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Again, they sought to arrest him, but he escaped from their hands. He went away again across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing at first. And there he remained. And many came to him and they said, John did no sign, but everything that John said about this man was true. And many believed in him there. Amen. So far the reading of God's word. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we, we just thank you for your word. We thank you that you've not left us without a guide, but you've given us a light to our path and a lamp to our feet. And this morning, as we turn to your word, God, we pray that you would speak to us. Lord, none of us are here because we want to hear from a man. Lord, we want to hear from you. So through the preaching of your word, would you, by your Holy Spirit, speak to us, encourage our hearts, build us up, turn us to look at your beauty once more, that we might rejoice in who you are. Lord, we long to see you glorified. So would you glorify yourself this morning through the preaching of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I wonder what sort of a experience you've had with, with fathers. It's probably just a plethora of different experiences, isn't it? Some of you would be able to get up and give testimony to an amazing father who year after year, decade after decade, has just loved you and cared for you and pursued you and done everything that a father should try and do. Some of you have the opposite extreme, don't you? Some of you, just, just the word father brings pain. Some of you don't know how to relate to God as Father. Some of you wish you had had a different Father. But you know, the fatherhood of God, even, even, if, you can't, even if you can't begin to get there to call God your Father, the reality of God as our Father is just the most precious doctrine. In fact, John Calvin would say that adoption, God making us his children, is the pinnacle of Christian doctrine. It is like the grandest thing you can get your head around, is the reality that there is a God in heaven who would make you his child. And so I don't know what your experiences have been. I know what some of your experiences have been, but I don't know what all of your experiences have been. But this I know. There is a God in heaven who is your Father, if you know Him. And He loves you. And He will never disappoint you. 
And he is perfect in everything he does. And what he wants is for you to know him. And Jesus, in, in this chapter, his intention is, is to show that he and his Father are one. And I want us just to learn about our Father through what Jesus says. It's a stunning, it's a stunning passage, isn't it? You, you can picture it taking place. It, it's a cold day at the temple. It's winter. And so they go up into the colonnade. It was like an enclosed-ish area. It was a bit warmer than down in the temple grounds where Jesus would normally teach. So him and his disciples and those who want to hear him come up there and they sit in there. In fact, it's the same place that in Acts, the new worshippers would gather together to preach and worship. And so they gather together there and, and the Jews turn up. And when it says the Jews, it's talking about the religious leaders. And the religious leaders, it says gather but the interesting thing is the word is a little bit carries a little bit more animosity than gather. It's the sort of word that you'd use to express uh, encircling around someone. So you, you know how it goes on the school field when there's the group of kids that decide to pick on someone and you look over and you see the band of about six people gathered around the one kid in the middle. It's that type of a picture. The Jews turn up and gather around Jesus. They encircle around him and they don't gather together for righteous intention, do they? I mean, you might be tempted to think so. The question in verse 24, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. And it sounds a little bit like, you know, they want to know if Jesus is the Messiah so they can believe in him. It sure reads that way a little bit, doesn't it? But for those of us who have journeyed through the book of John together, for those of us who have read through John before, we know the intention of these men, don't we? Several times John has told us that these men are seeking to kill Jesus. These men are seeking to persecute Jesus. These men are seeking to destroy Jesus. So what are they aiming at? What they're aiming at is they're trying to get Jesus to confess something that they can catch him on. They're trying to catch him out. What they want him to do is acknowledge, oh, yes, I'm the Messiah, and they can try and pin it on him. But Jesus masterfully deals with this, doesn't he? What, what is the implication of all of this? Is this question unfolds, really the 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 highlight, the sort of main thrust of this entire section is in verse 30. Have a look at verse 30. It's just this amazing, short, punchy little sentence which just jumps off the page at you. I and the Father are one. So if you want to summarize Jesus' response, Jesus, they asked, Jesus, are you the Messiah? And he says, I'm so much more than a Messiah. I and the Father are one. And they know what he's claiming, don't they? Because how do they respond? They pick up stones to kill him. They're going to stone him right there on the spot. They're not even going to drag him out of the temple. We're going to stone him in Solomon's colonnade because of blasphemy, because they know what he is claiming. There's no doubt about whether Jesus is claiming to be God or not. Some scholars will try and twist this and say, oh, he's, he's just explaining that God is, you know, like an earth, like a spiritual father to him, like he was to the Jews. But if that was the case, the Jews wouldn't be trying to stone him, would they? No, no, they, they fully, fully understand what Jesus is claiming. He's claiming to be one with God, one with the Father. And out of that reality, this, this stunning truth comes out. Firstly, that because, because him and his Father are one, because of God being our Father, we will never perish. Have a look at verse 25. Jesus answered them, I told you 
that is, I told you that I am the Christ, and you did not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. You know, some of you struggle with assurance. Yeah? Struggle with, with what, what if? What if I'm not saved? What if I have doubts? What if I don't know what happens in the next life? And you wake up one morning feeling great. You wake up the next morning and you're wondering if actually you've been a reprobate sinner your entire life and you've never come to Jesus before. Well, the fatherhood of God brings the sweetest assurance ever. You know, this, the solution to a lack of assurance is not to think about assurance. Teaching on assurance doesn't actually help you solve the problem. What you need to know more than anything else is that there is a Father, a God in heaven who loves you and holds you and makes sure that you will never, ever perish. Is it rooted, rooted in this? This is all planted in the rea reality of the Good Shepherd. And if you were here Sunday night, you'll remember, but most of you will be familiar with the Good Shepherd passage. It talks about Jesus being the shepherd who lays down his life and Jesus being the shepherd who leads them. Jesus being the shepherd who defends them. Jesus protects them. Jesus does everything to secure his sheep, to bring his sheep home. And Jesus roots assurance in that. But he he upgrades it, for lack of a better word. He takes it and he says, see, not only am I the good shepherd, but you as sheep are kept safe and secure by me as the shepherd and by my Father in heaven. Isn't that his point? He says in verse 26, you don't believe because you're not among my sheep, but my sheep, Hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never, not maybe, it's not maybe won't, it's not likely won't, they will never perish. And no one, not most people, no one will snatch them out of my hand. What does he mean? Well, it's pretty simple, isn't it? Those who are the sheep of Jesus will never, ever die. You say, wait a second, but we do die. So, oh, yeah, we do. But we'll never perish. We'll never eternally die but we will have eternal life. No one will ever take us away from God, like I said to the children. And I remember when I was speaking at the camp in Pukarau, I think I've told the story before, but I'll tell it again. There was this elderly gentleman who came up because I referenced this passage in one of my sermons, and this elderly gentleman came up and rebuked me because I'd understood the passage wrong. You see, when Jesus, according to this gentleman, when Jesus says that no one will snatch them out of his hand, what he means is no one except for me. So, me being the believer. So, you know, Satan can't snatch you out of his hand. Other people can't snatch you out of hand. But you can snatch yourself out of Jesus' hand. And I sort of scratched my head and I said to him, so, so Satan doesn't have the power to snatch me out of the hand of Jesus Christ, but I do. And he said, oh, yeah, there's something wrong here. You know, when Jesus says, no one will snatch you out, he means no one. Do you know how safe and secure you are? Can you just, just picture if God had hands, just picture God's hands. 
You see, not only is Jesus holding you, you picture the hands of Christ, he's holding on to you, but, but God comes along with his hands and he, he enfolds his hands over the hands of Jesus Christ. So in order, for, in order for you to get out, someone has to peel away the hands of God. And then having peeled away the hands of God, they have to peel away the hands of Jesus Christ. It's just unthinkable, isn't it? Who, who would have the power to open the hand of God? No one. That is you, brother, sister. You lack assurance. Picture yourself in the hand of God. You can't get yourself out. Those who are his sheep are firmly rooted and fixed in the hands of the living God. Never to fall away. Wait, does that mean I'm saying once saved, always saved? Yes. If you are saved. If you are saved. You will be once saved, always saved. It, it, Jesus isn't saying, you know, if you've prayed a sinner's prayer one time before, you're guaranteed to be saved. He's not saying if you responded at a camp meeting. He's not saying if you came to the front an altar call at a church. He's saying, if you are my sheep, I will never let you go. Assurance comes ultimately by knowing God. And that's the wonderful thing Jesus does. He shows us that this, that the second thing this leads to is a knowledge of God. Have a look with the text with me again. Verse 31. The Jews pick up stones to stone Jesus. I love this. I love this. Can you just picture the scene for a moment? They've all got their stones in the air. They're about to throw them. And Jesus says, wait a second. Just, you know, before you stone me, can you just tell me which good work you're going to stone me for? You can, you can imagine how upset they must be at this response. It's like, come on, we're not stoning you for that. We're stoning you because you're a blasphemer. Jews answered him, it's not for a good work that you're going to, we're going to stone you, but for blasphemy because you being a man, make yourself God. And Jesus does a beautiful biblical maneuver of getting himself out of trouble. Honestly, I wrestled with verse 34 through to verse 36 for probably three hours on Saturday. I just thought, what is the, what is the point? Now ask yourself the question as you read through this. What is the point? Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said you are gods? If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of he, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming, because I said, I am the Son of God? What does it add to the story? It actually adds nothing. So what's Jesus doing? He's doing a biblical maneuver to ensure he doesn't get stoned. Because his time has not yet come. Jesus isn't going to die by stoning in the temple. He's going to die upon a cross. But after that comes the, comes the real response. Verse 37. If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Now, I just want you to appreciate for a second the incredible love of Jesus Christ. Just picture the scene about to stone him. He does the biblical maneuver. He could have just walked out, yeah? He could have just packed his bags and gone home. But what does he do? He reaches out to them, doesn't he? That's what he's doing in verse 37 to 38. He's offering them salvation again. As his enemies come to destroy him, he reaches out to them and says, look, Look, you, you may not believe me, but at least, at least look at the miracles. Look at the water turned into wine. Look at the blind man healed. Look at all the things I've done. Look at the evil spirits cast out. Look at everything I'm doing. And, and maybe, just maybe through that, you might begin to see me and see the Father. 
You see, his heart longs for these people who are his enemies to come to him and be saved. That's our Jesus, isn't it? We come to him as enemies and he reaches out and says, No, no, you're not going to be my enemy. Hear my voice. Come to me. See what I have done. Jesus reaches out to them because he wants them to know the Father. And he wants you to know the Father. Maybe you've got a bad image. Maybe you just can't bring yourself to call God your Father. Jesus wants you. He is working in you. He is revealing his Father because he wants you to know him. He wants you to call him your Father in heaven. That's why we pray, our Father in heaven. He reveals him through works, doesn't he? He goes out and he does miracles. And it's the same for us, doesn't he? He goes to the cross and he dies. For what purpose? We all know John 3.16. Why? Because God loved you. He says, because I love you, my son is going to die for you. So that you'll look to the crucified Savior. You'll look to the cross. You'll turn up to Easter and you'll stare at that horrendous scene and you'll see a Father in heaven who loved you so much that he would not spare his own son. That when his son pleaded and said, God, if there's any other way, let it happen. The Father says, this is the way. And by seeing that, you will come to know and knowing, he says. Have a look at verse 38. That you may know and understand. Now, unfortunately, it's hard to communicate the Greek and the English because he he literally says, know and knowing. You're like, what does that mean in English? That doesn't make much sense. And and understand captures it somewhat, but it's it's this idea that you're going to Start, you're going to see the works of God. You're going to see the works Jesus does. This is what he wants for them. You'll see the miracles I've done and you'll know just a little bit. And then as as you know him just a little bit, it'll, it'll give birth to more knowing. And the knowing will give on more knowing and more knowing and more knowing. It's, it's kind of the same thing that John tries to communicate when he says that Jesus has grace upon grace. This idea of grace upon grace upon grace upon grace upon grace for you. He wants you to be knowing and knowing and knowing and knowing the Father. Are you knowing the Father? Do you know him? Can you say, I am a son, I am a daughter of my Father in heaven. If not, I just just want to challenge you. Turn to the Word of God and comb it with a fine tooth comb constantly until you can see him as your father. And do not give up. Keep searching, keep looking, keep knowing till you can look and say, yes, he's my father. But notice that the text doesn't end at verse 39, does it? It's interesting because it could have. John could have just finished at the end of 39, couldn't he? Jesus, they try and kill him anyway. They try and arrest him. He reaches out to them. They shun him. And he escapes. And you could just stop. So what is 40 to 42 about? 
Why is it here? John, John, no biblical writer does anything without a reason. Why does he put this here? He went away again across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing at first, and there he remained. And many came to him, and they said, John did no sign, but everything that John said about this man was true. And many believed in him there. Yeah, I think what John's highlighting, I think, I think what John is highlighting is the reality of this principle in action, but most of all, what happens to those who believe? See, John the Baptist, you think about John the Baptist for a second, he was consumed with what? Pointing out the Messiah. He was consumed with one job, proclaiming Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. That was his life. And so he went out and he proclaimed Jesus so that people would know Jesus, so that they would know the one who sent him. He says that as much in the first couple of chapters of John. The one who sent me told me that this would be him. Believe in him. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's pointing him out. He's pointing him out. Now, the one Jesus now goes out to the place where John has been proclaiming this one, this Jesus, this Son of God. And and you get the stunning contrast, don't you, where the religious leaders, the Jewish leaders, reject Christ as he reaches out, as he cries out to them, as he longs for them to come to him. They reject him. They try to kill him. But Jesus wanders out into the desert to a bunch of nameless people. And they're overwhelmed by what they have heard about the man. You notice the thing that convicted them? Verse 41, John did no sign. No, just pause. It's not miracles. John did no sign. But everything that John said about this man was true. The proclamation of the gospel by John the Baptist is the thing that opened these people's eyes. You see, he himself had come to know Jesus Christ, hadn't he? He himself had come to believe in Jesus. And because of that because he knew the Father, because he knew the Son, he now proclaims Jesus. And it's the same for us. You see, when when you come to see the Father, you come to have assurance. And And when you come to have assurance, you start to stop caring about what's going to happen to you, about whether you'll live or die, about whether you'll get to 80 or whether you'll get to 30. Because you're going to go and be with Jesus. And out of that, you long to know your father more. And out of longing to know your father more, and after knowing him more, you come to see how precious he is, how beautiful he is, how wonderful he is, and your burden becomes to tell everybody else about him. You know, just yesterday we dropped Mark and Joe off at the airport. It's just, that's just the story of their life. They have come to see Jesus Christ as the most beautiful thing in the world. So they want to go to Asia and risk their life so that the people in Asia can see how beautiful Jesus is. Is that, is that your heart? Have you seen Christ? Have you seen the Father in heaven? And become overwhelmed with him in such a way that you want to tell other people about him? If not, have you really come to know the Father? You see, our our desire to tell others about God is, is not, in the end, some duty we have to do. 
but it's just a recognition of how wonderful he is. Just like when I first got married and nothing pleased me more than telling people about how beautiful my wife was and how I was and still am the most luckiest man in the world and still have the most beautiful wife in the world and still love to tell everyone that fact. We come to see Jesus. We come to see the Son. We come to see the Father. We come to see the Holy Spirit as the most amazing God. And we just can't wait to tell people about it. Oh, you just won't believe how incredible my God is. Yeah, this is why I just love doing this every Sunday. And I wish I could do it every day of the week. I just love telling people about Jesus because he's just so beautiful, isn't he? He's just so magnificent. He's so splendid. He's got a father who loves me. It's infectious. Have you ever run into those people? You know, the ones, they've just been converted or maybe they've been converted for ages and they're just infectiously in love with God. And it's like, it doesn't matter what, it doesn't matter what they talk about. It just has to be God all the time. And you're like, yeah, but did you see the rugby game last night? And they're like, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. But did you see what happened in John? And you're like, yes, I did. But did you see the network? No, I actually don't care. But did you hear about Jesus? You know, and that's what our heart becomes. You know, what Jesus wants for us in this passage and in our life is for us never to perish. And so he's made a way. He wants you to know his father. So he's revealed him. And he wants the whole world to know it. So he sent us out to do it. Does your heart overflow in this way? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we do just worship you. You are a splendid God. You are amazing. And Jesus, you are beautiful. We thank you for your Holy Spirit, which has given us eyes to see, eyes to behold you in your glory. We pray that your spirit would continue to open them up, that as we turn to the word, as we sing your praises, as we fellowship with one another, we would behold your majesty, your loveliness. Jesus, continue to reveal yourself to us in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.